Hello and welcome to our July 3rd online service. I'm Jackson Brotherton, and I'm not only your host in the video right now, but also in the live chat. Hi Jackson. Today, I'm so glad that you could join us because we have a great service plan for you. We are going to hop back into Chris's summer series on Ford Together in Love. And today we're going to learn that love has more than one meaning and is four. For example, let me, let's say that I, I say, uh, I love to go to the park or I love donkeys or I love my dad. I love all of those things, but in different ways. I'll let Chris explain it later on in his sermon. But first, I got some announcements I want to share with you. Normally, this week is communion and our benevolence offering, but we are moving it to next week. Don't worry if you came prepared with your checkbooks or your loose change because there are still ways to give besides the benevolence offering. Here at the church, we have four ways you can give. First is in person. If you place an envelope in the lighthouse at the back, we can get it that way. Second, if you want to give online, you can go to sawbridgechurch.ca slash giving. Thirdly, if you go, if you want to e-transfer, you can send it to give at sawbridgechurch.ca. And lastly, if you want to send by text, just text dollar sign and then the amount you want to give to 84321. We are starting a new segment here where once a month we take some time to highlight some of our missionaries here in the church. So this week in our Mission Minute is Diane Wood. Hi, my name is Diane Wood and I am a Commission to Every Nation missionary. I have been on the field since 2013 serving in West Africa in Liberia. Liberia is a tiny nation of five, five million people. And what really called me to Liberia was an accident. It happened in an email that I received just when I had just finished um, teaching at West Hill Secondary School in Owen Sound. And they needed someone to teach at um, a Bible college in, in a, uh, a, uh, a remote part of Liberia where there are cannibals. And I didn't know about the cannibals but uh, they needed someone to teach English and to train teachers. So I thought, well, I can do that. I'm, you know, I've been a teacher for a long time. So I went. I didn't even know much about where I was going. I just, just knew that God wanted me to go there. And I had a wonderful time serving there. Um, and then Ebola came just you know, a few months, it was about seven months into serving there. And I, I had to leave because of Ebola and the, the whole country was shut down. And about 5,000 people died in Liberia from Ebola. After that, I returned to Liberia and the cannibals and all the other things that are really, really bad that happened there. And I just found a passion uh, to, to share Jesus and to tell people about how they can be saved. And it's just grown from there. And what I find really, really um, inspiring for me is to be able to inspire others. So that is why I love being on the mission field. And I hope that um, Many of you will consider going on the mission field also, wherever God calls you in, in this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane, for sharing. We're so excited to hear more from you and the rest of our missionaries in the coming months. If you want more information on some of our missionaries, you can email the church at info at That's enough announcements for today. Make sure to stay tuned on all our social media outlets to stay up to date with all our information and updates. This morning as we transition to a time of worship, I want to possibly call you out of your comfort zone. Sorry for the sneak attack, but with myself over these last few weeks, I've caught myself zoning out during worship because I'm not singing along in a big room full of people. I'm just sitting in my living room watching it on TV. And I haven't been singing along. 
So this week, I want to call you to sing along with me. If you normally sing along in a Sunday morning, good for you. You're <laughs> doing a lot better than me. But if you don't and you're anything like me, I've just come up with a hundred excuses why it's fine that I don't sing. Like, like maybe it's, it's good because I don't sound that great or it's good because like I don't want my neighbors hearing me. But worship isn't about if I sound good or if my neighbors hear me or not. It's about, it's about God. In the end, it's about God. So this morning, I want to call you to sing along with me as I sing to God. Will you join me?
never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop
silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful We have this one word, love, that we use in such a variety of instances and circumstances that it kind of messes us up and we kind of lose track of what love really means. The Greeks were so much smarter than us. They had four distinct words for love describing a different aspect uh, of love and I find that Understanding these four Greek words is uh, really helpful and really clarifying for me. And um, so we're going to just review those as we begin today. Then we're going to take what we kind of glean from those four Greek words and we're going to apply it to an example. It's going to be the example of marriage that we'll use. And then we'll close off our talk with three commitments uh, pertaining to agape. So let's begin with these four Greek words for love and let's begin with the word storge. Storge is an affectionate love. It's a love for a characteristic or an object. I love your smile, I love your attitude, I love your hair, I love your singing, I love your car. Uh, but I don't love your car the same way that I love my wife, and I don't love my wife the same way that I love your smile or your hairdo or your attitude. So storge is an affectionate love of an object or a characteristic. If we were to assign a posture to storge, it would be a looking at something, looking at the object, looking at the characteristic, and uh, we have an affection for that object, that characteristic, and there's, uh, there's an affectionate love there. That's storge. The second Greek word is philios. Philios is a brotherly love. It's a, it's a companionship love. It's a camaraderie kind of love. It's, it's the kind of love that you have with your friends. But I don't love my wife the same way that I love my friends, and I don't love my friends the same way that I love my car. I storge my car. I philios my friends. And philios is a really rich um, and valuable and necessary kind of love. 
And so if we were to assign a posture to philios, it would be a looking with someone. You might picture two friends standing shoulder to shoulder, kind of just looking at life together, looking at that adventure or that challenge or that opportunity, uh, camaraderie, looking at life. And there's a love there. And so you've got storge, which is a looking at, it's an affectionate love, looking at the object, looking at the characteristic. You've got philios, which is a looking with someone. This is camaraderie, shoulder to shoulder, looking at life. The third uh, Greek word for love is eros. And eros is the Greek word from which we get our English word erotic. And that is a kind of love. It's a romantic love, it's a sensual love, it's a sexual love. This is the kind of love between spouses. And so if storge is a looking at something and philios is a looking with someone, eros is a looking into someone. This is a staring into their eyes. This is a soulmate kind of love, a soul touching kind of love. Uh, love, and it's really a wonderful love. The fourth word for love is agape. And this teaching series, Forward Together in Love, we could also call it Forward Together in Agape, because we're talking about agape. Agape is a very, very distinct kind of love. Agape has nothing to do with feelings. Eros has a lot to do with feelings, Philios has at least something to do with feelings. Storge is all about feelings, but agape has nothing to do with feelings. Agape is the kind of love that God has for us. And agape is the kind of love that we as followers of Jesus Christ are called to have for each other and all others. In fact, when we read 1 Corinthians 13, those first seven verses, um, the word that Paul uses is agape. In John's gospel, chapter 13, verse 35, we've talked about this, where Jesus says, I give you a new command that you agape one another the same way that I've agaped you. So agape has nothing to do with feelings whatsoever. Rather, it is a commitment to ascribe worth to another. Agape is a commitment and it's an action, and we'll talk about those two things, a commitment and an action. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So whereas storge is a looking at something, and philios is a looking with someone, and eros is a looking into someone, agape is blind. Agape simply assigns worth to the other person. Agape is blind, to storge issues, agape is blind to philios issues, and agape is blind to eros issues, agape simply ascribes worth to another. Agape is blind to the externals. Those externals that can be rather distracting, even off-putting, Agape is blind to those externals, but in another way, agape is the most profound way of seeing because In agape, we look at another person the way God looks at them. We see their inherent worth. Agape love looks past the externals, but actually does see that which is most precious about a person, namely that they are created in the image and likeness of God and they're worth Jesus dying for. Last week, we looked at a couple of verses in Ephesians chapter five, verses one and two, where Paul said, imitate God, He said, live a life filled with love. Again, it's the word agape. Live a life filled with agape. Well, how do we do that? He says, follow the example of Christ. If if it were possible to somehow have a dictionary where we could look up agape, we would see the picture of Jesus there. I've got Acts 1.8 in my head right now. Uh, It's not in my notes. But Acts 1.8 is, is just before Pentecost, and Jesus says to his disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive power so that you can be my witnesses, my 
representatives, my, my messengers, my ambassadors. And Jesus describes four distinct places where his followers were to be his couriers of his agape. The first place was Jerusalem, which made sense because that's where they were at that moment. The second place was, Samaria, was um, Judea, which makes sense because that was the area surrounding Jerusalem. The fourth area makes sense because he said to the whole world. But the third area is curious. He said to Samaria, make sure, make sure you are couriers of my agape in Samaria specifically. Why would he mention spe Samaria specifically? See, the, the Jews um, had a really difficult history and relationship with the Samaritans. The Jews did not like to travel to or through Samaria. It, it was near them, and yet it felt foreign to them. And the Jews had a really troubled history with the Samaritans. And with the Samaritans, there was a lot of prejudice. Jesus specifically called them to go to Samaria. What does that mean for us? What is our Samaria? What is near us that feels rather foreign to us? Where maybe we have a troubled history and where maybe there's a lot of prejudice. What is Jesus calling us to do? Let me leave that there. 1 John 3.16, uh, John 3.16 is an awesome verse, so is 1 John 3.16. John says, uh, we know, we gnosko, we know by experience what real love agape is. How do we know what real love is? What does it look like? Well, we know it because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's agape. Jesus laid down his life for us, and so we lay down our lives for each other. Agape is a commitment, and it's an action that affirms the worth of another at cost to ourselves. And the ultimate expression and the ultimate example of this is Jesus. So let's take these things that we've talked about in these four Greek words and uh, apply them to an example, and we'll use the example of marriage. When you get married, perhaps when you got married, you made some vows, you promised some things, you committed to some things, you committed to love um, for better, for worse, in richer, in poor, in sickness, or in health. When you promise that, when you got married, the only kind of love that you could possibly be committing to is agape. The only kind of love that you can possibly be committing to when you promise to love in sickness and in health, richer, poor, uh, better, for worse, is agape. Why? You cannot promise lifelong storge. So when you got married or when you get married, you cannot promise lifelong storge. You can't do it. See, when you get married, fellas, maybe, maybe, you, uh, maybe you had a real, maybe your wife had, had long hair and you just had this real storge love, this affection for her hair. And uh, then you come back from the honeymoon, she goes to the hairdresser, gets it all cut off. And you go, what have you done? I loved your hair, and now you've gone and wrecked it. Or maybe when you got married, maybe, maybe uh, ladies, you had an affectionate storge love for your husband's smile, and then he gets a puck in the teeth. Uh, this is Canada. That could actually happen. Uh, or maybe you had an affectionate storge love for your husband's hair, and he didn't go and cut it off. It just fell out. Or maybe when you got married, you had an affectionate love for your husband's physique. He was lean and, and, um, and uh, shredded and, and all those, uh, whatever those terminology, uh, whatever that is. But, you know, then a few years goes by, right? Any, 
he puts on a few pounds and stops working out quite so much. And then it's a Friday night, it's a date night, and he goes and he pulls those old jeans out of the drawer and puts them on and now they're kind of tight and he does them up and he looks like what you might imagine a, a marshmallow might look like if you put an elastic band around the middle of it. You may store gay hair, you may store gay a smile, you may store gay a physique, but hair can get cut or fall out. Teeth can get knocked out. A physique can suffer the ravages of time and gravity and too little exercise and too many calories. You can't promise lifelong storge. Storge comes and storge goes, but agape is there forever. And agape is blind to hair, and it's blind to teeth, and agape is blind to physique. You can't commit to lifelong eros. So when you get married, you can't commit to lifelong eros. There are times in marriage where it's like eros is firing on all cylinders, and it's like really good. But there's other times maybe even seasons, when Eros seems to go on a vacation. But you still love. You still agape because agape is blind to Eros. You can't promise lifelong Eros. When you get married, you can't even promise lifelong Philios. Now, there are times in marriage where you share this beautiful friendship, this this uh, shoulder to shoulder, looking at life together, looking at the tasks and the opportunities and, the, and, uh, and all of those things. And it, it, it's really great. It's a beautiful friendship. But then there's those times in marriage where it's like, dude, I, I really don't like you right now. Now, marriage is not based on philias. Now, it's good in a marriage where there can be some storge. That's a really good thing in, in a marriage. It's, it's a really helpful thing in your marriage if there are some things that you are just kind of affectionate about with your spouse. Storge is great, but marriage is not based on storge. And it's good in a marriage to have philios. Like if you can stand shoulder to shoulder uh, in, in deep friendship and looking together at common goals and common tasks, philios is great, but marriage is not based on philios. And it's good, like really good, to have eros in a marriage, but eros is, uh, is, is largely based on feelings. And, and we talked about feelings last week. They're fickle, they're chemical reactions, they're responses to what's going on in our head. Marriage is not based on eros. When it comes to marriage, the Apostle Paul tells us that marriage is based on agape. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, Husbands and wives, submit yourselves to one another and agape one another the same way that Jesus has agape the church and gave himself up for her. So in marriage, we are to affirm the worth of the other. And that is not something that you can fall into and that is not something that you can fall out of. It is something that you choose. Agape is a choice that you make at the very core of your being. You can fall in and out of storge, you can fall in and out of philios, you can fall in and out of eros, but you can't fall in and out of agape because agape is a choice and not a feeling. You choose to get in and you choose to get out. And that's why agape is the most profound kind of love. Again, it's a choice that you make at the very core of your being, and it has nothing to do with feelings. It's a choice. It's a commitment that you make. And when there's feelings associated with agape, that's great. But when the feelings are not there, you choose to ascribe worth to that other person. And so Jesus would tell us that the fundamental call of the follower of Jesus is to be an agape person. And an agape person is one who ascribes worth to all other persons at all times, all other persons at all times and in all situations regardless. Jesus said, they will know that you are my followers by your agape. And so we as followers of Jesus are to have an agape stance. We're to, we're to take an agape posture toward all others at all times and in all circumstances, no ifs, ands, or buts. 
Agape does not mean that I storge you. It means I affirm your worth. And agape does not mean that I filios you. I'm not going to be best friends with everyone. In fact, there are some people that you shouldn't be friends with. Flat out, there are some people that you should just stay away from, but you still agape them. You still affirm their worth. Agape does not mean that I want to be romantically involved with them. I just affirm their worth. So in this series, we're talking about agape. We're not talking about storge. We're not talking about philios. We're not talking about eros. We're talking about agape. And again, our our posture, our stance as followers of Jesus is to affirm the unsurpassable worth of every human being as created in the image and likeness of God and worth Christ dying for. Last week, we talked about the radical words of Jesus that we see in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, where he says, love your enemies. Here's a really practical question for you. How do we love our enemies? Because our enemies, by definition, are people that we do not storge, we do not phileos, and we certainly don't eros. How then do we love our enemies? Well, Jesus said, agape your enemies. We affirm their worth. We affirm the worth of our enemies as people created in the image and likeness of God worth Christ dying for. They're of unsurpassable worth. And if you can love your enemies, well, you can love anybody. If you can love your enemies, you can love everybody. So how do we do this? All right, three commitments. Um, Sometimes you will hear Uh, like New Testament scholars talk about the three components of a person. And they'll talk about spirit, they'll talk about soul, and they'll talk about body. Our spirit is really the core of our being. It is who we most authentically are. Our spirit is that place where we, um, that, that relates to God. We're born spiritually dead and we're made spiritually alive in Christ. Our soul is our intellect, our emotion, and our will, or our thinker, our feeler, and our chooser. And our body, well, that's self-explanatory, that's our body. Agape involves all three. Agape involves your spirit, it involves your soul, and it involves your body. So we want to look at three commitments. First of all, agape begins with a commitment that you make in your soul where you just commit at the very core of your being to be an agape person. You say, I just want to be like Jesus. I want to love prostitutes and tax collectors and disreputable sinners like Jesus did. In fact, I want to, I want to, I want to agape everybody that I come in contact with, even my enemies. It's a commitment that you make in the very core of your being, in your spirit. It's not a promise that you're going to be successful all the time, because you won't be, and I won't be. It's simply a commitment that says, this is the direction that I want my life to go. I'm not going to, I'm not going to operate on the, on the basis of feelings anymore. I choose to be an agape person. I'm drawing a line in the sand today. This is the first day of the rest of my life. I want the trajectory of my life going forward to just be that I want to be an agape person. It's a commitment Maybe we've made that commitment in times past. It's, it's a commitment that we need to come back to uh, again and again. It's a commitment that says, Jesus, this is the direction that I want my life to go. Would you make that commitment today to say, Jesus, I want to be an agape person. I'm drawing a line in the sand going forward, the trajectory of my life. I want it to be characterized by agape. I'm not going to do it perfectly, but this is the direction I want my life to go. The second commitment involves our soul, and we said that our soul is our thinker, our feeler, and our chooser. We said that agape is a a commitment and it's an action. So the commitment of our soul is really, is really, the first action of commitment takes place in our thinker, in our mind, where we just choose to agree with God about the value of all people, about the worth of all people, where you see past the externals that you notice, and you just choose to agree with God and ascribe unconditional worth 
to every person that you meet, every person that you meet. You just choose to agree with God that they're of unsurpassable worth. They're created in the image and likeness of God and worth Jesus dying for. Just a slight aside here, I wanna just point out one thing that's gonna be a barrier to this happening, and that is judgment. Judgment is antithetical to agape. Judgment is ascribing a conclusion to a person that is a detraction of worth. Judgment is ascribing a conclusion to a person that is a deficit of worth. That worthless so-and-so, that immoral so-and-so, that hypocritical so-and-so. In judgment, we draw a conclusion about a person as though we were God and knew all the details of their lives. Judgment is the opposite of agape because you cannot both detract worth while at the same time ascribing worth. The word judge itself, as we see it in the New Testament, is the Greek word krino, and it means to separate. And what we find is that God is the only one qualified to judge. One of the reasons for that is the fact that he is the only one who is omniscient. He sees everything with perfect clarity. There is nothing that is ambiguous to God. He is the one uniquely qualified to judge. When we judge, we usurp a role that belongs exclusively to God. We are not omniscient, but we judge as if we were. And and, and again, Ephesians 5.1, Paul says, imitate God. This is why context is so important. We imitate God in his love. We do not imitate God in his judgment. Now, we do discern. Discernment and judgment have some similarities. They both have to do with separation. Judgment separates people. Discernment separates things. Discernment separates healthy from unhealthy, uh, helpful from unhelpful. You discern that someone is not an individual that you would phileos or that you would eros or that you would storge but that does not mean that you do not agape them. You still affirm their unsurpassable worth. So discernment attaches itself to storge issues and discernment attaches itself to phileos issues and discernment attaches itself to eros issues, but agape attaches itself to the inherent worth of a person. And that is why judgment is antithetical to agape. You cannot both love and judge a person at the same time. You cannot both ascribe and affirm worth while at the same time detracting worth. This is why if you take the 30,000 foot view of the New Testament, you will see two huge commands. One big red light and one big green light. The red light, don't judge. The green light, do love. We are to be outrageous, agape lovers of all people, all people, at all times and in all circumstances, no ifs, ands, or buts. And so often what blocks agape is the judgment of unforgiveness that we hold against another person. They've hurt you. They've wronged you. They've detracted from your worth. And so you want to hold them accountable as though you were God. And you walk in this awareness of detracting their worth and you draw conclusions about them as if you were omniscient. What forgiveness is, is simply letting go of the judgment. Forgiveness simply says, God, I know that someday you're going to balance the books. God, I know that someday you're going to straighten all these accounts. At some point, I'm going to leave that to you. I release the judgment to you. I'm not going to walk in that. Because when you walk in unforgiveness... It will eat you alive from the inside out. It will pollute you. It will poison you. Unforgiveness, uh, some would say, is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. The only person who pays is you. And so God says, release it. Let it go. Don't judge it. Release it. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not, well, now I've got to give this person a second chance. Forgiveness is not well, now I guess I have to trust this person because maybe flat out that person is not trustworthy. Forgiveness is not, okay, now I have to be best friends with this person. 
Forgiveness is not about having some warm, tingly affection for somebody. Forgiveness is simply about affirming their worth, that's agape, and letting go of the judgment. True story, a woman goes to see her pastor for some counsel. She's wrestling with some issues of forgiveness and love. She's a a wife and a mom to young children, and uh, she says to her pastor, she says, Pastor, my dad thinks that I don't love him. And so the pastor says to her, well, why does he feel that way? She said, because when I was a child, my, my father sexually abused me. And now that I'm an adult and married with kids of my own, and my husband and I want to, want to attend a couple's retreat, my dad wants to babysit the children. I forgive him, but I don't trust him to watch my kids. And my dad says that I... I don't love him and that I haven't forgiven him because if I did, I would let him watch the kids. It's so important to understand that there is a difference between storge and philios and agape. This woman released the judgment. She forgave. She affirmed the unsurpassable worth of her father. But whether or not he's trustworthy, that is a completely separate issue. Plus, this woman had agape for her kids. And so really, it was an act of love on her part that if she didn't think her dad was trustworthy, it was an act of love for her kids to protect their safety. And so she said, Dad, I do love you. I do forgive you. I just don't trust you in this. And I find that sometimes there are some Christians who kind of walk around with with a with a sense of self-condemnation because they don't feel all warm and tingly about the people that they've forgiven. And because they don't feel all warm and fuzzy toward that person that they've forgiven, they somehow doubt the validity of the forgiveness. As we said last week, forget the feeling stuff. Forgiveness is a commitment of the will, just like the agape from which it is sourced. Forgiveness is an act of the will. It's a decision and it's not a feeling. Release them, turn them over to God. Okay, the third commitment we said is a commitment of the body. Um, So commitment number one is a commitment we make in our spirit. I just want to be an agape person. Commitment number two is is an action we take in the mind where we just choose to agree with God about the inherent worth of all people. And so commitment number three is is in our body just as we live day to day. If you make those commitments, you will find that every day you just find opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to express agape. When we're not walking in love, we're not going to see those opportunities. Our eyes are not going to be open to them. But if your eyes are open and you're just going through life affirming the worth of all people at at all times around you, you're going to see all kinds of opportunities to love people uh, outrageously. And it may be in really small ways. Maybe it's with a smile. Um, When you're wearing a mask, that's rather difficult. So maybe maybe with some really authentic eye contact, maybe a kind word, maybe a warm handshake, maybe maybe opening the door for somebody, maybe helping somebody with their groceries, maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's cutting a lawn, uh, shoveling a sidewalk, maybe it's that text message that you send, that letter that you write. You'll see opportunities to affirm the worth of other people. Maybe sometime you'll have an opportunity to do something big, like lay down your life for somebody. Big or small, it's all kingdom stuff. Jesus would speak about mustard seeds, and he would say that the kingdom of, that the kingdom of God is like mustard seeds. There's a bigness in the smallness of things. I think it's great to show agape in extraordinary ways, But I think there is something powerful. I think the kingdom moves forward most 
by just small acts of love, small acts of kindness, mustard seeds uh, planted. I think that's how the kingdom grows best. Little things that maybe nobody sees, maybe nobody will congratulate you. Uh, you're, just, you're just walking, it's just your body is moving through life and it's your hands and it's your feet that are ascribing love, small acts of love. Every single day, every new day is a new opportunity to practice this and every person that you encounter is a new person uh, to whom you can lovingly affirm their worth with small acts of love. Wherever you are right now, you don't even need to wait 60 seconds probably to begin this. You can begin with the person who's with you right now or the people who are nearest you right now. So will you commit? Will you make these three commitments today? The commitment in the spirit to say, Jesus, I commit myself to being an agape person. I'm drawing a line in the sand going forward. This is who I want to be. I'm not gonna do it perfectly, but this is the direction that I want my life to go. Will you make that commitment in your mind just to choose to agree with God about the inherent worth of all people uh, at all times, in all circumstances, no ifs, ands, or buts? And will you make the commitment with your hands and with your feet to just express in millions of small ways, acts of love that just affirm the unsurpassable worth of all others. Holy Spirit, would you in this moment just press deeply into us these three commitments. We long to see your kingdom moving forward as we express the worth of all people in Jesus' name. Over these last two weeks, every time we read 1 Corinthians 13, that last verse always sticks out to me, and I have it here in one of my dad's old Bibles, is what it says. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I love that. I, I literally love love. And today, as Chris talked about the four different kinds of love, I want to challenge you to show those four different kinds of love today. We are nothing without God's agape love. So let's give that love to others. Thank you guys for joining us today and may God's love be with you as you go. We hope to see you next week. I love you all. I miss you. See you soon, hopefully, if anyone's watching this. If my mom hasn't turned off the TV by now, I love you, Mom. I love why. Well, I love you, Dad, too. And I love donkeys, apparently, according to the script. <laughs> okay, I'm done. It says, and now these three th remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these three is love. I'm going to reread that because I read it wrong. <laughs> oh, look, he's got notes. He's got notes in here. It's always good to find a Dave Brotherton note in your Bible, you know? I'm Jackson Brotherton, and I'm your host not only in the video right now, but also in the chat. Hi, Jackson. <laughs> Hello and welcome. I'm Jackson Brotherton, and I'm... Normally this week is communion and our bene benevolence, uh, benevolence, benevolence. Normally this week is communion and the benevolence offering, but we are moving that to next week. Don't worry if you came prepared with your loose chain, uh, your loose.